and it says starting recording and we get the little glitch and okay we're back yep okay and we're back cool all right so just wanted to carry on with the, the story about kind of um what's happened recently in your life and where you are now and, and how, yeah, that, sure. how, you, how you see that what's up what that was like for you really and um how you see it kind of influencing your work now your your artwork and just your, your outlook really maybe Okay. Okay. Well, like I said, I had cancer last year and like every, everybody gets cancer. It was a sudden diagnosis. I had had a tumor in the side of my neck for a couple of months before that, but I didn't know it was a tumor. I thought it was something related to my thyroid problem. Yeah. I had a bad day at work. They took me to the hospital. They wouldn't let me leave the hospital. It's Germany. If they think you're sick, they'll hold you like a prisoner of war. You don't have any choice in the matter. And then they came back to me after doing a bunch of tests and said, we need to operate. So then they operated a few days later, um, came back about 10 days later. And that surgeon told me, I got really bad news. You've got a malignant tumor in your neck. You have cancer. You need to go see a specialist right away. This is a bad situation. Mm. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, same reaction everybody has that's told they have cancer. Um, Went and saw the specialist, Professor Dr. Zink, really famous guy. He teaches at Johns Hopkins University. Um, he also teaches in Ireland. He teaches at some other hospitals worldwide. Um, I asked him what my chances were. He said, ah, let me work on this. I think you got a 70% chance of a five-year survival rate. They measure cancer survival rates in five years. I said, okay, 70%. I'd like to hear better than that, but 70% is good. I'll take it. I was real and, you know, I was real aggressive because you know me, I, I don't want to, I, I got stuff to do, man. I'm not ready to give up and quit. Yeah. Later on, I found out it was probably less than 50%, but the evaluation just isn't okay. Everybody with your situation has this chance. A lot of it has to do with what's up in your head. Mm. Okay. Another guy I know in the United States, who's a doctor told me you probably had less than a 40% chance when he first diagnosed you. But once you got through the surgery, yeah, then it went up. The problem is, is going through the surgery, the surgery you went through would have killed a lot of people. Okay, because they cut my neck open on both sides, took out all the lymph nodes, took out the tumor, they took out my tonsils. It was not a pleasant experience. I'll put it to you like that. Mm -hmm. um, then I went through radiation and chemotherapy because they couldn't find the primary tumor. And the only way they can cure you is to basically Chernobyl you with thousands and thousands of rads of radiation. And as one doctor said when I was there in February, uh, Mr. Reem, there is no way there can be any cancer left in your body because we shot enough radiation in you. Anything that was there is dead. Mm. We killed it. Said, you are you were about 90% dead when you get out of there. Believe me, the cancer was dead. Mm. Okay, we killed it. That was the second thing was the radiation therapy really kicked my ass. Mm. And you know my background, you know, I was a paratrooper, I was in the Ranger Regiment, I did all this other stuff. Yeah. You can hear it in my voice, doesn't sound normal, it's still coming back to normal. Um, so I went through all this shit, and um, my attitude after really, the first night was really bad. I, I had to go to the doctor and get some anti-anxiety drugs, which I've never had to do before. But after I had... 72 hours to think about it. My attitude was basically paratrooper. Well, what the hell, you know, mm. just have to go with this and see where it goes. Um, I finished treatment <clears throat> October 2nd. I felt like I was going to die for about five days after that. I was down to about 95 pounds. Yeah, you said you lost almost half your body weight. Yeah, I lost half my body weight. I was in a bad way, man. It was not good. And I went through this as a day patient. I did not sit in the hospital for five weeks. I did not let them put a feeding tube in my chest. I did it as a day patient and came home at night. Mm. Okay, so I went through 6,000 rads of radiation and five chemo. Basically, I went up to the hospital in Augsburg on the train and crawled out of there and then came home and took care of myself here at home. Mm which is pretty abnormal. Nobody's done that up in Augsburg for at least seven or eight years. Mm. Most people, they have to be committed for at least five to six weeks and they have to have a feeding tube put in and they can't eat. And eating was tough. It was hard. It still is. Um, it's better. 
I'm up to 135, which is what I was in high school. I don't look thin anymore. Look right. Mm-hmm. Um, so how did this influence things? Well, basically, my attitude now is, is man, I got to paint because I'm still alive. <laughs> and I got all these <laughs> ideas in my head. And I got to get them down on paper before I'm dead. Mm-hmm. Okay? Or on canvas or whatever. Okay. So really, I mean, that's really the effect of it is, you know, I, I thought I was going to be dead when I was 25 in the Army. I thought I was going to be dead in a year. My mm. first infantry platoon, everybody in my first infantry platoon, the mortar platoon is dead. Mm. Everybody except me. They were all dead within two years. They were all dead before I left Central America, okay? Um, death and I are old friends. I've been dead twice, okay? Okay. I was dead from leptospirosis, and they had to plunge me into a vat of ice to get my temperature down and get me going again. Gave me um, not not the shock therapy, but they like worked on my heart. You know, they gave me the CPR, physical hand CPR. Oh. And then when I was in Green Beret School, I was dead for four minutes and thirty nine seconds. And they did do this the thing with the paddles, and, you know, clear, boom, all of that. And I'll never forget waking up, and this. Um, I heard this medic, yeah, we got him back. That's fucking awesome, you know? And it's like, oh, wow, I just came back from the dead, you know? This is pretty interesting. Um, and, I mean, being dead for four minutes and 39 seconds, that's a long time. I was 29 years old at the time. I was in great physical shape. You know, I went on to college. I graduated number one in my engineering class. So whatever effect it had, it wasn't that big a deal, okay? So, I mean, I've been around death a lot of my life. I've seen a lot of it. Um Basically, yeah, that's my attitude. I got a lot of things to paint and draw and hopefully some stories to write. I'm going to try to get down as much of it as I can as fast as I can possibly go. Well, and you you also, um, I mean, those are some of your brushes with that. So you also mentioned helicopter and airplane and crashes. And it's unbelievable. You're like the fall there guy. There were two airplane crashes, a helicopter crash, um, some other thing. I almost got killed by having a truck run over me in the army um i hit a telephone pole at 100 miles an hour and a barracuda with a drunk guy that taught me never ride with a drunk person never Mm -hmm. ever get in a car with a drunk person for any reason get a taxi walk home do something do not ever ride in a car with a drunk person because both front wheels of the car ended up underneath our seats how we did not lose our legs or worse i have no idea Okay, and the engine was basically on my legs, but didn't crush anything. Oh. Well, you're definitely being watched over. I mean, you've had so many, so many brushes. It's just, it's incredible. So, so well, now, but I, I mean, was a stupid idiot. Okay, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, the helicopter story. You're on the right. You're on the the, the opposite opposite side of the, the chopper when it crashed. I mean, it's just. I, it's like out of a movie, but it's all true. Um, so, you know, I mean, you could tell that though. You could you have many, many stories. Could fill another reel. Um, so, so now, I, what I think is just just uh, inspiring for me is how prolific you are in terms of the painting and the writing and everything else. And I know also we didn't talk much about your technical work at the moment. You were doing hackathons. You know, you you're a real Renaissance man in terms of you building uh, an artificial intelligence uh, cybernetic. Uh, uh, that's got a long way to go uh, before it has any artificial intelligence in it. I just have the but, framework. But, but the point is, you're doing, you're, you're working at so many levels. You're firing out. You're living full on. You're just getting back into cycling. You know, you're, a, you know, you are like a, you are to, to me as professional semi-pro level cyclist. I mean, before all this went down, and now you're getting back on the cycle again. So you know, you're, you're on the upswing, which for me as your friend is really great to see. I mean, you've, you've been weathering the storm incredibly well. Uh, as, as as I would expect you to do with your your character, I just I just don't like I just don't like quitting. I don't like giving up, and I will you know I will quit something when it's not working anymore. Okay, that thing is not working for me, so it's time for me to stop doing it. Okay, but I, I don't like being one of these people who's like oh poor poor pitiful me wah 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 wah. I, I just hate that. I've hated it since I was a little kid. Okay. Here's a great little kid story. It relates back <laughs> to the painting, My Side of the Mountain. Uh-huh. When I was six, we moved to Washington, D.C. We lived in a suburban community 40 miles outside of Washington, and we lived in a, sub- a Levittown subdevelopment. You know, Levittown, New Jersey, Washington, it's all the same crap. 
and there was this huge woods behind where I lived. It was actually three blocks behind my house. There was a park, a little park they built, and then there was 200 square miles of absolute total wilderness with deer and rattlesnakes and copperheads and all kinds of stuff. And when I was six, I was like, mommy, 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 I want to go down in the woods. I want to go play in the woods. I want to go play in the woods. You can't do that until you're eight years old. So for two years, I harassed my parents endlessly about going and playing in the woods. When I was eight, I was finally allowed to go play in the woods. And I did. And I went to the woods. And I got cut up. I got, you know, I ran into poisonous snakes that would kill me at that age. You know, copperhead or a, a, or a cottonmouth or, or um, water moccasins or rattlesnakes, timber rattlers. They'll kill a nine-year-old kid if they bite you. You're dead, okay? It's serious stuff. I ran into a deer one day, big buck. And it was really clear that if I moved the wrong way, that was going to charge me. There were drug dealers down there. There were predators, human predators, okay? It was these huge woods, 200 square miles. Wilderness. I found a cannonball down there from the Civil War. <laughs> I mean, it was cool. I went out there and played for years. I went down there. Me and my friends went down there and played, Okay. That was my side of the mountain, was this huge woods I went and played in. But if you think about that, that's absolutely crazy. You send an eight-year-old kid alone to this fucking forest where there's rattlesnakes and copperheads and water moccasins and stuff? That's dangerous, man. That's not, that's not going to, like, the local park. That's going out in the wilderness. Really. Okay. And I got through it. You know, my parents bought me a survival book. <laughs> that was my present when I was eight years old. And I read the book and I carried it with me. And I remember when I was done with that thing, it was so beaten up, there was barely anything left of it. And there were times I had to bandage myself. I got cut up bad. I actually put stitches in myself one time because I got cut so bad. Okay. It was like a nine-year-old kid. Yeah, I know. It sounds like John Rambo, okay? To me, this was normal, okay? <laughs> this was my normal. I thought everybody lived like this. Later on, I found out, no, this is not how everyone lives. And you're nuts, Christopher Ream. But, but you have that, you have that, there's that sort of intensity to you, as you say. You kind of live life full on and full out, right? So you're on the, you're on that, you're on your learning edge and you're on that frontier quite often. Yeah, yeah, I, I always am. And, and, okay, now I got gray hair. I'm an old man, or at least I look like an old man. Um, but, you know, inside, I'm still the same guy I was in a lot of ways in architecture school, or even that eight-year-old kid or nine-year-old or ten-year-old out there, you know, in the woods. Um, I got a real positive attitude. I got a real upbeat spirit, and I think that carries me through more than anything else. And I just, I don't like giving up, man. Giving up is just not my deal. It's just not what I do. None of my heroes as a little kid ever gave up. Giving up is not in my vocabulary. And I have bad days, man. I'm having some bad days right now in this lockdown. I've been in this apartment. I've been out on bike rides and walks and go to the grocery store and stuff. But basically, I've been here now for 45 days. Mm. And it's a little weird, okay? I went into Munich two weeks ago to get my work computer. And it was terrifying. I went in on the train. There's nobody on the train except me. It's never like that. It's usually standing room only. Same thing when I get to Munich and I get on the subway train to go to work. It's always standing room only. There was two guys in the subway car. There's cops everywhere. Nobody checked my paperwork. I have a piece of paper from the German government that says I'm allowed to travel because I'm an important employee of the city of Munich, okay, which is weird anyways, but okay, whatever. You know, but I've got paperwork to travel through a German town. I mean, you know, remember, I'm an American, okay? This is like weird flashbacks to childhood, like thinking about movies and stuff. Papier and Pitta, you know? Nobody asked me for it. Everybody was cool, you know? Everybody's trying to get along down there. But the train station had 5% of the people in it it normally does. Okay? This is weird. This whole thing that we're going through right now, this lockdown worldwide, it's a weird experience for everybody on the face of the earth. Everyone. No one is having a good time with this. Nobody on the planet is enjoying this. Um, and it's dangerous. You know, we forget that there are people in hospitals working tonight where there's somebody dying every 10 minutes. 
mm-hmm. from this disease. And that's serious stuff, man. That is not BS. And the best thing we can all do is to stay at home and paint a picture or write a song. Or if you're, you know, play a song for somebody. My, I have some friends from Leicester that do a Monday night concert. And they do it all via video on Facebook. I got friends in Florida that do that from a friend of mine who just died of cancer. Um, great guy, Daryl Cuisenberry. He was, the, he was the drummer in my rock band years ago when I had my first big rock band. And he was a star when he joined my band. I was nothing. I was the new guy. But he was a friend of mine. So like, yeah, I'll help you out. And then after six weeks, he told the other guys in the band, most of whom were famous, hey, I think we should keep this together as a band. I think Chris and Kara got a really cool band here. And we should support them and help build them up and make them great musicians. And because of him, I became a great musician. It took somebody who was brilliant to help drag my ass out of the unknown. And, hey, this is the famous Johnny Fire, you know. And, um, and what was the name of the band? Digital Witchcraft. There's a video, actually, on YouTube. You can see us stepping out 1989. You can watch me, and you'll laugh your ass off when you see it. I'll send it to you after. Yeah, um, yeah. Point, point being, Animal died a week and a half ago of, of colon cancer, and he took me through for months. He was like my guide and my guardian through this cancer thing. And basically what he told me was, you need to enjoy your life. You need to get out and ride your bike when you can. Even if you don't feel good, if you, even if you can only go five miles an hour, go ride. You need to paint. He'd ask me before he got really sick, All right, did you paint today? No. Well, go sit down and paint. Stop worrying about the cancer. Stop worrying about the tumor in your neck and go sit down and paint. Okay? And that was basically what he taught me was you got to go live your life, man. This, this cancer thing, he, when he was diagnosed, he was given three months to live, and he managed to make it a little over three years. Mm. So for me, he's more of a hardcore type A guy than I am. Mm. Because I was given much higher chances than that from the beginning. They told him he had stage four terminal cancer right from day one. It's like, we cannot save your life from this shit. It's bad. Mm. So... Yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, that's another thing. I think about that, and I look at these stacks of paintings over here, and what am I going to do with them? Well, either I'll give them away or I'll sell them to somebody. Something will happen, but I'm going to keep painting because that's what animals want me to do, mm. you know? And that's, you know, that's what I can do. So it's not really that I'm a big type A personality. It's just that I just don't want to sit here and feel sorry for myself. I want to get up and go do something. Mm. Yes. Well, I mean, it's your story is really inspiring to me um, as as a friend. I've I've kind of drawn strength from your story. We reconnected it, you know, more recently, and um, appreciate you sharing all the, everything your your heart, your your soul, your story. Um, so, what what are you working on now? What can we look forward to seeing next from you? Um, some more sea beastie paintings. I've got at least eight or nine landscapes over here I need to work on, one of which I think is going to be really brilliant. Um, and then after that, I'd like to go back and finish some of these oil paintings, but I'm not sure if I will or if I'll just go on with the watercolors. The thing about the watercolors, like I said, I can do them much faster than the oil paintings. Mm. And I started off with watercolor when I first started painting, I started off with watercolor, and I really like watercolor. It's not the easiest thing to work with. Really, the easiest thing to work with is oil paint. Mm. Because if it doesn't work, you can just wipe it off the canvas and start again. Oh, that doesn't look right. <sighs> okay. It's like an eraser. You can, and you can think about it. For, you can just leave it there for a day. Nah, I don't like that. Boom. You can wipe it off and start again. Mm. So it's really hard to go wrong with oil paints. If you're trying to learn how to paint, Get oil paints because you, if you don't like it, you can just start all over again. It's no big deal. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oil paints are really, really easy. Also, you paint in oil paints, you paint from darks to lights. That's much easier than watercolor. In watercolor, you mainly paint from light to dark, mm-hmm. which is a much harder thing to do. Okay. Putting in all the darks and then putting the highlights on top of it, that's easy. Anybody can do that with a little practice and training. Going the other direction, leaving the light in the painting and then adding the dark over it requires a lot more skill. Mm. Um, what else do I have? Um, I'm thinking about, I've got an idea in the back of my mind for another series that isn't the Sea Beasties, but it's something 
probably a little more adult, a little less optimistic, but it's another science fiction surrealism theme on another planet. But that's as far as I've gotten right now. I'm still developing okay. stuff in sketchbooks. Um, the flower paintings, I think, are about to really explode. The botanicals, the, the stylized, they're called botanicals when you do these flower paintings. I think that's about to explode. I've got some really serious ideas there, and I'm seeing where to go with it. I had to learn a little bit about how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to do at least... I'm only done five of them, but when I did the first one, I had no idea what I was doing. Now I have a little bit better idea. I need mm. to do 20 more, and then I'll know where to go with that. Same okay. thing with the half-timber houses. They're going to turn into something bigger. Um, and then, of course, landscapes and cityscapes. I've got a 1,000 pictures from uh, my visit to Prague at Christmas. Oh, yeah. And I took those pictures because, like I said, I'm basically a studio artist. I like working from home. So there's an idea there, you know, that I can do stuff with that. And then there's a surrealistic painting that I have that's a bell over a tower growing out of a tree. And that's actually from a song called Babel Babel about the Tower of Babel, where they tried to build a tower to God. And that's where God creates all these different languages so people can't speak to each other anymore. I've actually got an idea to take that painting and develop a new series of imaginary worlds around that. Mm. But I haven't, that's a long way down the road yet. I got a lot of stuff that I'm working on right now. I mean, I've got, if I didn't have to worry about money, buy my paintings, baby, buy my paintings, <laughs> baby, buy my paintings. If I didn't have to worry about money and I could just paint all day long, wow, I got some good ideas. I, I know stuff will just pop out of nowhere. It's like anything else. If you do it all the time, you got more ideas, more stuff comes out. Okay, so any, any, any listeners who want to commission you, you could fit that in. I would be interested in commissions. Oh, I have some drawings. I don't know if you. I don't think I've showed any of them yet. Um, I have some drawings of dragons. I've been oh. working on a series of dragons, which may turn into something else. Okay, I'm not sure yet. I'm okay. thinking about how to take that. It may turn into dragons in a very realistic environment or something. Okay. Well, you have to show. You have to show me that sometime. I'm a, I'm well, we can do another one of these things in a year or six months or something. To, so to be continued. Okay, so uh, just as we're, we'll, we'll kind of wind down so you can, we can watch the, the concert and things. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, only, I guess the, only, the main thing is, is that my art is supposed to be positive and happy and fun. Okay, that's what it's about. All of my paintings have a little block on the bottom that says, little, this little crimson block, like something out of the Middle Ages. Um, that was inspired by Albrecht Dürer who I consider a sort of my spiritual mentor in this whole thing. There's a good story there, but I'll tell you that offline, okay? Um, I want my paintings to bring happiness and joy to people. That's what they're about. I, I don't need people to sit there and ponder over them and have deep thoughts. I mean, there's, some of these things will inspire deep thoughts, no question. But it's not supposed to be darkness. I'm not painting, like I said, I know a guy who paints concentration camps. I, I'm not doing that. That's not my thing. I, I don't want to paint the misery in this world. I want to paint something like, like in the Middle Ages, something that makes people happy, that makes them feel better. I live in a world here, Augsburg, where like if you go to the cathedral in Augsburg or the church, two minutes from my house, is this Rococo church with all these hundreds of paintings inside of it that are about Jesus and God, and Mary Magdalene and stuff. And they're supposed to give people hope. Okay. I don't paint religious paintings, although I may end up painting one for St. Aphra up at the cathedral in Augsburg. She's buried in the crypt there. She was a saint who died 1700 years ago in 360 AD or something like that. I went there and prayed when I had cancer that I'd be saved. Well, I've been saved, so I guess I'm going to have to do some kind of icon, you know, and lay it on her grave. I want to make sure the priest gets it so it sticks around for 500 or 1,000 years. Grave's 1,700 years old. Man, I've never stood in front of the grave of a saint 1,700 years old. That's hard to find, man. It's one of the earliest saints in the Christian church. I'll paint an icon for her. Be cool, okay? Um... But yeah, I'm not a religious painter, but I'm inspired by this 
theme, and one of the things I see out of all these religious paintings in these churches that I visit in Augsburg and Munich and other places down here in Italy, I bet, you know, I spent a lot of time in Italy with my girlfriend when I was in business school with you and stuff. Hmm. Those paintings gave people hope. That's what they were about. Okay? And they gave, they made people feel better. So that's what I want my artwork to be about. Wonderful. I think that's a perfect way for us to wrap up. To say it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, Chris. Um, thank you so much for sharing from your heart and soul. And more to come. Stay tuned. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that was a good interview. Now we got to try to download these things and see if we can get them off of get them off of Skype and everything, and I'll put them up. Okay, cool. All right. Take care, man. Take care. Bye. Take care.